we come into your presence today to seek your blessings. We pray that you reveal really each of us, that you grant us according to your will and provide us all of our needs. We pray that in this hour as we spend time in your presence, that you will accept our wish. Jesus name.
uh, keep your Bibles open in the book of Jeremiah chapter 36. To put it into context, in the beginning, Jeremiah the prophet, he was preaching for about 23 years. And the scene in Jeremiah chapter 36 is, uh, is set just before King Nebuchadnezzar, um, the, the siege of Nebuchadnezzar of uh, Jerusalem. And it was about 18 years just before the destruction of the temple. Let's begin reading. That's the scene of the king who is going to the Okay, and it reads, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So the king that I introduced to you in the beginning is Jehoiakim. That his word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah against, and against all the nations from the day I spoke unto thee, from the days of Josiah even unto this day. When I read these two verses, I wanted to know what it was that God wanted Jeremiah to write from the days of Josiah. While I was trying to search for this, it led me to to uh, dig deeper and to, uh, to know more about the kings that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, here's the list. Oh, it's too small. Okay. Is that the full size of the... Uh, here's the list of all the kings that were there that ruled uh, in Jerusalem and in Judah. As you can see, Okay, this side is Judah and Benjamin, of course, and the ten northern tribes, which is called Israel. Uh, when you look at this side, we have 20 kings on Judah, and we have 19 in, uh, sorry, yeah, on uh, Israel. Uh, before that, we had three kings who were common to both these kingdoms. Uh, how they split and all that, I'm not going to be going into that, but they split because of disobedience and because of uh, rebelling against the word of God. So the kingdoms were split and it goes on and on. When you see the list of all the kings in Israel, the reputation that each of the kings have is put here. Every single one of them were bad. That, that's what God had labeled each of them, that they were bad in the sight of God. When you see the kings in Judah, it was a combination of both good, bad, and uh, you know, some of them were bad and then returned to Manasseh. Uh, I don't know if you remember, he, he was he was termed as one of the uh, baddest king and then he repented. Uh, today we are going to be looking at Jehovah who is almost to the end of you know, the end of the kingdoms. That's when in BC 586 we see that Babylon uh, Babylon in captivity. So this is where we are going to be looking at today. But before we could go into that, just want to go through an express run of the final from the beginning up to this place. I'm not going to take too long, it's going to be very, very quick. Okay. Okay, to just recap from the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. We all know that. And God made earth habitable place. And then he filled earth with life and he created Adam and Eve. And God gave them guidelines to live 
but they disobeyed. And because of the disobedience, they were taken out from the Garden of Eden. And as a result, God established the sacrificial system for them as a remedy for their sin. Um, then we see that as years went by, earth was becoming populated and slowly there was a group of people or almost the whole earth, they, were for, they forgot God completely. And the Bible says that all their thoughts were evil, continuously. God had no choice but to destroy the earth. And that's where we see the flood and Noah and his family were saved. <coughs> then we see Abraham, he lived a faithful life. And when he lived a faithful life, he was promised great things. We see the, um, the promises in Genesis chapter 12, verse, 7, uh, verse 2, and then we see in 17, verse 4 to uh, 8. Then we see after Abraham, we see Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Then we see his son Jacob. Now in the story of Jacob, we see that he deceives his father, uh, and then he, and then when he's going back to Bethel, God asks him to go where God, God is asking him to go. But in the fear of meeting his brother Esau, he wrestles with God and demands a blessing. And that moment, from that moment on, Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel. <coughs> Now, Jacob, we know, had 12 sons. The 12 sons of Jacob are what we call today as Israelites. Okay. Um, now, we know from the story of uh, the children of Israel, that's Jacob, that the 12 brothers, Joseph, was taken as prisoner. And then we know all the story that happened. Uh, there was famine in the land of in, you know, everywhere there was famine, and then because Joseph was man of God, God revealed to him what to do, and by the providence, God made plans that He could save the children of Jacob, the Israelites. Okay, they were all brought into Egypt, and when they were in Egypt, they were flourishing, they grew, and they were stuck there in Egypt for 430 years. That is when. As slowly kings changed in that place, they started to forget about God. They were made slaves. They probably they looked much different from the natives there, so they were made anybody who looked like them, they made them as slaves. And that's why we say that they were in slavery. They continued in slavery, probably they forgot about God. Then God raises up Moses, and that's when he takes them out from Egypt. To, into the wilderness and then to the promised land. <coughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness as, as we go, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, instructions for life because they have forget, forgotten everything. Uh, probably they forgot even God, so everything had to be recounted to them and that's why the Ten Commandments were rem reminded, as it was a reminder for them for the commands of God. And after Moses, God raised judges, and then the people were not happy. They demanded for a king because the other heathen countries they had kings with them. So they said, "We also want a king." Why did they ask for a king? Because they no more could uh, could say that God is going to be our king. All that time in the Bible, we see that God was their king, but when they realized. When the realization came to them that they don't want God to be their king anymore, they were asking for a new king. And God reluctantly appointed Saul. And then that's how we see the list of all the kings in here. <coughs> the book of Jeremiah is a book of God calling his people to repentance. All through the book, that's what you can see. Uh, either you repent from your ways or face the consequences. And the consequence, as we see, because they did not disobey, there was destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, let's 
Let's read the scripture reading that we have. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in the time past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed, heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we know that God gave his words, the scriptures, the Bible that we have, were given to his prophets, which are given to us. And in these times, for the last days, it is still relevant for us. That is what we read in the scriptures. So what is relevant for us today? And as we, uh, as from the introduction, what was the reason for writing the, uh, for, for the things that happened in there? Now let's go back to the uh, story that we began with. So God is asking Jeremiah to write a scroll about the impending judgment on, on the nation. Verse 3 says, uh, Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way, then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. So the reason that God is asking Jeremiah to write down all the verses is because he was hoping, he, was, he had the urge that every one of them will turn their ways, turn to him and change their ways, be repentant. That is what he was wanting for. This was the reason for writing the scroll. Uh, the next verse in verse, verse 4, we see a glimpse of how the Bible, the entire scriptures were actually written. There may be other methods that were used as well, but this was one of the methods. So we, here we see in verse 4, Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of uh, Neriah, and Baruch wrote on the scroll, at the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to. Probably Jeremiah had a vision and then everything that he could recall, he spoke and he called Baruch to write down everything. We see many instances of these kind of things happening in the scriptures. Uh, we, and to reaffirm that we have even in the New Testament, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 and then 2 Peter verse 1 and 21 where it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Let's see what happens next. <coughs> Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am restricted. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Um, this, this word, the verse 5, I believe maybe because he was restricted, maybe he was, he was banned from going to the house of God because of the previous uh, messages that he gave, strong messages that he gave. People could not, uh, you know, they did not want to hear that kind of message. Messages of warning, messages of destruction if they don't turn their ways. And that is what Jeremiah was doing. And probably he was banned because of that. Let's read further. Verse 6. So you go and read from the scroll which you have written at my dictation, the words of the Lord to the people in the, in the Lord's house on a fast day. And also you shall read them to all the people of Judah who come from their cities. Perhaps their supplication will come before the Lord, and everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and the wrath that the Lord has promised against his people. Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading from the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. I don't know if it uh, about a year for the scroll to be completed or, or if Jeremiah was waiting for the right moment the right moment by by right moment I mean you know the fast that was being declared probably people kind of understood the prophecies that are there and the warnings that Jeremiah had given earlier they had some kind of belief but not fully committing themselves into that they knew the message like we do today, we all know the message. We all completely believe that we are living in the last days. 
but they did not make any change. They did not turn their ways. Everything that they did did not. Uh, did, they did not do according to how they should have actually been for them. For God to turn His wrath. How are we today? Are we living what we know? As we know that we are living in the last days, are we being preparing ourselves for the last days? So we see here that Baruch reads the book that was dictated by Jeremiah after a year. Uh, because we see that in the first verse we see, uh, verse 1 it says, what does verse 1 say? Which year of Jerkim did he... Which year? Fourth, isn't it? It was in the fourth year of Jerkim in, in, in verse 1. And then in verse 9 you see, Now in the fifth year of Jerkim, the son of... Uh, Jerkim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people... In the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. Then, okay, so the fast that was declared could be because they kind of believed that, the, that they are going to be attacked. They were, they were already being, you know, there were some signs of Jer Nebuchadnezzar coming and capturing them and all that, but they were not fully, they, they did not want to believe that it was going to happen fully. Then Baruch read from the scroll the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of uh, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the upper court at the entry. So we see here that Jeremiah, the Baruch, goes into the temple, into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and then he reads the scroll that he wrote according to the words that were dictated to him. Now, Did you all follow that in the Bible? Verse 9. Let me change it here. Let's move to verse 11. Now, when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, had heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he went down to the king's house, into the king's chamber, and behold, all the officials were sitting there. Elishama the scribe, and Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, and Elnathan, the son of Akbar, and Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah, the son of Ananiah, and all the other officials. Micaiah declared to them all the works that he had heard when Baruch read from the book to the people. So we see here that Micaiah, one person, one official among everybody that were present in there, he, he, when, he, when he listens to all the words that were being read, he reports that. Okay, then, then all the officials sent Jehudi, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Shemaleh, the son of Pishi, to Baruch, saying, Take in your hand the scroll from which you, read, you have read the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and went to them. They said to him, Sit down, please, and read it to us. So Baruch read, read it to them. So the second time, he's been called into the office of the palaces where all the officers were and he, they, he's been asked to read the scroll once again. First time he read in the temple, now he's reading in the, uh, in the palace of the office. Uh, verse 16, when they had heard all the words, they turned in fear one to another and said to Baruch, we will surely report all these words to the king. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? After reading the, the house of the Lord, the scribe's son, Jeremiah, goes to the officials and repeats the words that he heard. And we see here that one named Jehudi ask, is asking Baruch to read it to them in their chair. And then they are asking to confirm, how did you write this? Was it dictated by Jeremiah? How, or is it your own words that you have written? And we see in the words that fear fell on them. 
from the words that were written. And these words were the words of destruction of the place. That they're going to be captured, they're all going to be made as captives. Surely it affected them a lot. Um, and then we see in verse 18 and 19, uh, from the, for the question that was asked to him, was it his dictation that is Jeremiah's? Then Baruch said to them, he dictated all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink on the book. Then the officials said to Baruch, go, hide yourself, you and Jeremiah, and do not let anyone know where you are. It was a threat, isn't it? Was it a threat, or was it a warning to him? Because of the warning that Jeremiah and Baruch are giving to the officials and to all the people in the land, they are being retaliated back, saying, run for your life. That's what we are saying here, run for your life. You, Baruch and Jeremiah, both of you, you need to fear for your life. Why did they say that? If, when we, if we go back a few chapters, 10 chapters back, chapter 26, we see a similar incident happening. Uh, from verse 20 onwards, chapter 26, verse 20 to 23. And there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of Kirjat who prophesied against this city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. And when Jehoiakim, the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went into Egypt. And Jehoiakim the king sent men into Egypt, namely Elinathan the son of Achbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Urijah out of Egypt and brought him into Jehoiakim the king, who slew him into this world and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Can you see why there was a warning? Urijah had done the same thing. He had given a message earlier and he was killed. He ran away. He ran away to Egypt from Babylon. But he, people were sent into Egypt and he was dragged back into, the, into his place, into, the, into Jehoiakim's palace and he was killed. So as soon as they heard the message that was given, the, the scroll that was written, these people, the officials knew that Jehoiakim the king is going to kill these two as well. Verse 20 and 21 uh, from Jeremiah chapter 36. So they went to the king in the court, but they had deposited the scroll in the chamber of Elisha, mother's tribe. So once the scroll was read in the, uh, with the officials, they take the scroll and keep it. They store it in a place. They keep it in maybe in a shelf or a storage somewhere that they have. And then they send Baruch away. And then they go to the king. And then they report all the words to the king. Verse 21. Then the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. And he took it out of the chamber of Elishana the scribe. And Jehudi read it to the king as well as to all the officials who stood beside the king. Are you all with me till now? Are you understanding the things that is happening here? Now we are coming to the part from where I began. Where I began 2624 years ago, in the ninth month. Let's see what happens. Now the king, verse 22. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with the fire burning in the brazier before him. When Jehudi had read three or four columns, the king cut it with the scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. Yet the king Okay, so this is what had happened. This is exactly what I said in the beginning. Children, are you all listening? Okay, so Jehoiakim, when the scroll was being read, as each row was being read, he takes it, 
gets a pen knife, cuts it into pieces, puts it in the fire and burns it until the whole scroll is completely burnt. The practice of cutting God's word as well. Today someone wants to, people today decide what is right and what is wrong for themselves. It is relative. You may say, I think it is right. Or I may say, I think it is wrong. Brethren, brothers and sisters, and the older children, it is not what we think is right. It is what God's word says is right that counts. Many people today believe that what happened, what is recorded in the Bible is just you know, fairy tales. Um, maybe it is good as a moral teaching. People would take stories from the Bible and say, okay, it is good, this is how we should be. But not as, a, as an incident which actually happened. They, many people today say we have progressed beyond that. We are living in the scientific world. We can reason out to ourselves what is needed for us in our life. By reasoning out that way, we are actually cutting the scriptures. We are, we are using, we may not be using a knife to cut the scriptures, but in theory, yes, we are. Are you tempted today to hold a pen knife to God's book? Are there any passages in the scriptures that we don't like? And we just brush it away and say, okay, it doesn't apply to me or we just want to say, okay, let me do it later on. Is there any part of scriptures that is that way in, in our life? If it is that way, then we are cutting it. Scriptures, they're cutting the scroll. We may not be like putting it in fire, but yes, we are using a knife to cut it and only use whatever is needed. So, why did Jehoiakim actually burn and cut the scrolls? What could be the reasons that he did that? Maybe he thought. It is not the word of God, it is only the words of Jeremiah read by Baruch. Maybe he believed that. Or maybe he was afraid of the word of God. And somehow he must have thought that by destroying the scroll, he is making the word of God powerless. Are we doing that as well in our life? Okay, in the following verses, we, we read that God speaks to uh, Jeremiah after, after cutting all the uh, scroll and putting it in fire and everything is destroyed. God speaks to Je Je Jeremiah again and he asks him to write everything that was in the first and also add to it more again because of Jericho. Let's read verse 29. Why did the king do this? What made him burn the scroll? Okay, we see that 27 and 28 that he was asked to uh, write the thing again. Verse 29 it reads, and concerning Jehoiakim, he want, God is asking him to write everything that he had read before and also adding everything that was concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, you have burned the scroll, saying, Why have you written it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and will make mad and beast cease? Jehoiakim apparently could not stand it that his nation is going to be destroyed. He, he just could not accept that. He thought he was kind of invincible. 
He thought he would stand forever until, until he would live. The word of God has been under attack since sin, uh, sin entered into this world. Right from the beginning, since the fall of man, the beginning in the Garden of Eden, God's word has always been under attack. Uh, those people who never found joy in the word of God are the ones who were the forefathers to be leading in the destruction of God's word. They always try to find fault in the word of God. Today many people try to find fault saying, it has been overwritten and written. Uh, it's been changed, the scriptures have been changed many times. Um, and they try to, you know, that is one of the excuses that they give. If you remember, when the Ten Commandments were given, even that was destroyed. Of course, it was in the rage by uh, Moses that it was destroyed. But what happened after that? It was written again, isn't it? The word of God, even though it was destroyed right in front of the people, it was still given again. It was written again and again. When you look at the history, uh, in the Roman history, there were many people who actually completely wanted to destroy the Bible as we know today. It was in the, uh, I remember one of the preachers, who was it? I think it was Pastor Hassan who gave a, gave a history of the Bible where you know, he, he said, I don't know, was it here? Somewhere I heard. Uh, that, was it here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bibles were burnt. Everybody were asked to bring the Bibles and put it there and it was burnt. Just because you burnt the Bible, does it make you away, do away with the Bible? Does it not? Does God burn it? God's word? Just because it is written in the Bible, does not mean that? And you destroy the Bible, does not mean that the word of God vanishes? God's word always stays. It's heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass. The question that I want to ask you today is, are you worthy God's word? I'm not talking about you know, actually tearing it and putting it in the fire place. Are we truly keeping and doing God's word? Every time we say maybe a small lie, we are actually turning God's word. Every time we envy somebody, uh, maybe having a better car than me, we are actually burning God's word. Every time we disrespect or dishonor our parents, children, we are actually destroying the word of God because you know it's, it, is, it has no effect in you. Every time we find, as the Bible says, we find a speck in the eye of your brother, but then you don't even see the beam that is there in your own eye. And when we find the speck, we are actually burning the word of God. Jehoiakim could not stand God's word because it was pointing his wrong doings. Uh, by destroying or by justifying or by rewriting God's word to suit our needs does not change the fact that God's word remains the same. You see in Jeremiah 36, 32 as well, that Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the son of Nerai the scribe, and he wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the book of Jericho, king of Judah, and burned in the fire. God's word will always stand forever. The words that were burnt, it was the only copy that they had, the scroll. It was burnt. But God gave Jeremiah again the thoughts to write the word again. If it was not for Jeremiah, God would have raised another prophet, another word of Shri and another Jeremiah to do the same work. I have a question for you. 
among God's commandments, among the Ten Commandments that is given, which commandment do you think you will detest the most if somebody does it? <coughs> if somebody is involved in breaking one of the commandments and come to you, and you, you come to know about that, which one of the ten do you think you will detest the most? I'm talking about you personally. The first one is God will be detested, but which one will you detest the most? Which one will be like? Um, what will feel like going there? Yeah. Which command? Thou shalt not kill. Anybody else? Which commandment do you think would be the most detestable for you? Bring all. What about adultery? Would you accept somebody who you know openly is committed? How would you feel? I hope none of us will experience that. I trust and believe that all, all of us, including our children here, will never have to go through that experience. But is that not something which is very detestable? You don't even want to be near to a person who is involved in that. Isn't it? Okay? With that thing in your thoughts, let me take you to the book of Jeremiah again, chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 6. It says, They say, If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harm with many lovers, yet return again ye. Again to me, said the Lord. Okay, so this God is giving messages to the people. He's, he's telling Jeremiah to, to put all these things in words. So he's telling that you have you have gone with many, many, many people, you know, many, many lovers. This is not this is not talking about human relationship, but it is actually uh, in, in context of spiritual adultery. Okay. Verse 6, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel had done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and they have played the harlot. I hope you understand what this harlot. Anybody does not? Know? Okay, that's committing adultery. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she turned not. So even adulterous people, God is telling, turn you unto me, but they don't want to turn to God. That's what we see here. Let's see further. Verse 12 and 30. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou back smiling Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thy iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. What a merciful God we serve, isn't it? Even the most detestable sin that you may have, the worst thing that you may have done in your life doesn't matter what it is. God is saying here, He's telling Jeremiah to write and tell to the people about all this. And He says, If you just turn your ways, I will accept you. What does it mean to turn your ways? We have this beautiful song Keep me in your will so I will not be 
in your way. Sometimes we think that I am in control. That's a song. The moment we have this confidence saying that I know what I'm doing, I am in control, I know everything, that is when we need God the most in our life. Keep me in your will, so I will not be in your will. Every time that we get involved in any kind of sinful sinful activities, many times we, when we do that, when we do something wrong, we, we find it strange to go to God. I don't know about you, but many people who, who do wrong continuously in their life will have no will to go towards God because their confidence is so low to go towards God. God is telling you, it doesn't matter what it is. Even the most detestable thing that you have ever done in your life, you just turn your ways. Turn your ways in the sense it is not, you know, just, you, you may not be able to do it immediately. Even the thought in your mind, the urge that you want to change is enough in our life. God will accept us. And he will make a way for us as long as we do not stand in his way. As long as we do not make, we, we, as long as we do not think that we are in control. But we need to let God to be in control and everything will be fine. Last Sabbath, we learned the importance of forgiveness. And I believe it is equally necessary that we repent and turn from our sinful doings and to be doers of the word and not burners of his word. May God bless us as we endeavor to do this word. Thank you. Because we are attracted. And so Lord, we plead for strength and for mercy. And we pray that you would forgive us of all our sins. Help us grant us the strength to turn from our abilities and to do that which is right. Lord, let's pray especially for those students who will be going to different places to seek a career in their life. And I pray that your blessings be with them. And most importantly, that your presence will be with them, that they will not go away from your ways, that they will not seek their own way, but always in your ways. I pray that you will bless each of us as we leave this place with the blessings that you have for us on this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray.